And that is, it is a, it's called show business. For and a reason. For a reason. And speaking of show business, welcome to a Lunch Break with ATI. My name is Don Farrell, Artistic Director and Co-Founder of The Theater Company. And I, we've got a very special guest with us today, Mr. Wayne Powers. Is he here? I know. Somebody told me. In person? I got the memo that he was here somewhere. <laughs> yes. He, he, we're waiting for him to show up. No, I'm right, kidding. Right. <laughs> it's like waiting for Godot. Boys. Got a long wait. Mr. Wayne Powers, you all know him. Uh, this guy has done it all. I mean, he's a jazz vocalist. He's an actor. He's a voice artist. He's a comedian. He's a radio personality. He's a broadcaster. He's a T purveyor. Yes. He's a uh, uh, scamp at large. I love yes, that. A my, scamp at large. A comedian historian. This guy has done television, radio, recording, stage, concerts, nightclubs. He was... And bazooka bubblegum rappers. Right? <laughs> and bazooka bubblegum rappers. And he's going to be at Feinstein's coming up with his uh, one-man show. When is that? That's in July? July 22nd. July Saturday, 22nd. July 22nd. So yeah. go go to uh, Feinstein'sHC.com. The HC is for, for Hotel, Hotel Carmichael. Carmichael. So it's Feinstein's HC.com. HC. Yeah. And uh, you can check out and get tickets to his show. But we're going to learn a lot more other interesting things. And there's actually a little tie-in. I'm going to kind of go through some of this stuff. You have so... I got to uh, the the pleasure of meeting you the other day through our, our dear mutual friend, Meg Osborne. Oh, yeah. And, um, and the stories that you share. And, you know, when you meet people that are kind of cut from the same cloth, it's so exciting. And you're... I mean, these the people, the things that you have done... The things that my, you have my learned. My cloth has been cut a quite a few times. I'm in tatters, actually. I mean, this guy, Dinner Theater Days with, uh, co-starring with Dick Sargent from TV's Bewitched. Do you remember that? I used to grow up with TV's Bewitched. I loved that. He was the title role of Inside, Inside Eddie Binstock. Binstock, which he co-directed with actor-playwright Tim Robbins. Before he was Tim Robbins. I mean, before, before he was Tim yeah, Robbins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Well, there's, a, there's a great story there. He worked with Robin Williams. He used to do improv improvisation with him. And according to your website, he says he improvs, impro improvis improvised, improvised, thank you, yeah. improvised regularly with Robin Williams and lived. Yes, <laughs> if you want to call this living. Oh right? my gosh, he was the recurring cop officer Bagatelli with Penny Marshall, the, 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 the Laverne and Shirley. Who remembers Laverne and Shirley? I used to watch that all the time. You were amazing in that. A uh, Full House. Yeah, Mackenzie Phillips' boyfriend on One Day at a Time. Murder, She Wrote. Uh, Doogie Howser. Adam 12. Simon and Simon. It goes on and on. Paul Sorvino. The, you you taught, uh, you performed, taught, and impro directed improvisational comedy at Hollywood's famous improv uh, on Melrose. He's done everything and tying into what I want to lead, eventually lead into. I want to hear stories from you. But also, he was the best friend of Elvis in the TV series Elvis and Me. Uh, but about the story about Priscilla Presley's life with uh, Elvis Presley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that's and leading up to my series. Your series? Oh, yeah, shoot. I had, I had my own series on NBC for two seasons called 13 East. 13 East? On Saturday nights just before Golden Girls. Uh oh, that's a good slot. Yeah, that was a great slot. A really we won our time slot. slot every week, and then they canceled us after two seasons. Uh, what do they know? But, you know, that's show business. Show yeah. business. That's what we were talking about before. It's half show business, half show, half and half business. 50-50 yeah, is what we're trying to always uh, achieve. So, uh, and the reason about the Elvis and me is tied in also because we're we're in rehearsals right now for Million Dollar oh, Quartet. Yeah. What a great show. Which is really, really fun. We had an amazing rehearsal with these guys. Yeah. Uh, we brought them in from all over. So one from Los Angeles, one from Chattanooga, one from <coughs> uh, New York, one from Virginia. Yeah, I saw I Everybody. saw the cast. Well, you a very impressive cast. Yeah, we're really we're really yeah, yeah, yeah. they came You in. should be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of how we roll here today. <laughs> well, I like that. <laughs> So tell me, what do you want to talk about? I My goodness, I don't even know where to start. I don't know. You go ahead. Start. Okay. Well, first of all, I I could not turn my head away from the TV whenever Robin Williams is on. What a brilliant, brilliant man! Yeah. I mean, the, I I don't know how. First of all, I appreciate and respect those who do improvisation. That is, that's just like you're walking out on a, a, a high wire. And Sticking just, your neck out all the way. Yeah. All the way. And that's it's the only comedy. way it's any good. And it's comedy. So that's even additional, yeah. additionally difficult. Um, yeah. 
I did a, uh, a show called Three Guys Naked from the Waist Down years ago, and it's about, uh, it's the metaphor, it's not really guys with their pants down, it's about the metaphor of feeling like you have your pants down in front of everybody when you do stand-up comedy. Yeah. And so we went to open mic night as like a, um, a, a research, and boy, where the, that audience was tough. I mean, yeah. you know, sit stand back, Stand-up is tough, make us laugh. I, was, I was the worst stand-up comedian in the world. I mean, I, I tried it, because I was, you know, in Hollywood back in the 70s, and and that's when the comedy store was going, and the improv was going, and, yeah. was, and the comedy, you know, the comedy boom was just starting then. Uh -huh. So you know, people like Jay Leno and David Letterman, they, they hadn't been discovered yet. They were working the comedy clubs, you know, and uh, and it was a golden time for comedy. And so you know, I, I tried it. I was terrible at stand up, awful, because I, I couldn't walk out there and just be me. Now, I'm a sketch comedian, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. give me a character. So I, I got into a show called Off the Wall, which was a little eight-member improv comedy group. We were at, we were in Hollywood, and the second story uh, of, of a building in a ballet studio, you oh. know, mm -hmm. on Fairfax Avenue in Hollywood. And we used to hang curtains over the mirrors in the ballet, you know, over the, the dance bars and the mirrors, and, and folding chairs and a little platform stage and a couple of lights, and and suddenly we had a show. Well, there. There was a line waiting to get in there as time went on. Mm. In the audience would be like Dudley Moore, Gary Marshall, Norman oh Lear. Oh, wow. And that's how we all got discovered. Robin Williams got, originally he got Laugh-In, which was a, a, a George Schlatter recreated Laugh-In, which didn't really last. But then he got Mork and Mindy out of it, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. was. That's, that was Gary I, Marshall. I watched that all the time. Love that. And then yeah. with Jonathan... With Jonathan Winters. Winters, who's oh, also brilliant, too. But there would be no Robin That's Williams right. without Jonathan Winters. Jonathan Winters was my lifelong friend. And he did the liner notes off my first album. Yes, and we'll talk about that right He's, here. Wayne uh, Powers. That's the yeah, Alice. There it is, right here. Oh, doing an awful <laughs> job of, of present, presenting. There it is, y'all. Oh, no, no. There no, it no. is. Look at that. Do I, do I ever look like that? Wow. That's my fedora and everything. It's got a hat. Yeah. Bringing the hats back. I want to bring the hats back. I like my hats. hair. Yes, yes. But yeah, Jonathan. Jonathan was a genius, and you know, and I loved Robin. And Robin was a friend. And I was, I mean, I was at his first wedding in, in San Francisco. Wow. And uh, but Robin, to me, was a master technician, where Jonathan was an organic genius. Mm. And there's a difference. Robin's mm -hmm. brain was like a computer. He, it was like a spine. He just took all that information in and he could spit it out. Yeah, yeah. So we would do an improv show and, you know, uh, other people would come out with funny lines and whatever, myself included occasionally. Yeah. But there were other great, great comic, comic performers in this group. And then afterwards, you know, you can't go to sleep after you perform. So we would all go to the comedy clubs, the improv or the comedy store. And then Robin would have to stand up. And he'd be saying some of the lines that were ours. <laughs> like, Wait a minute! Hey, who wrote that? But he didn't do it. He, he didn't do it maliciously. Right. It was whatever went in could come out. He uh -huh. had no filters, and so it was. It was that 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 way that he operated. But he idolized Jonathan. Mm -hmm. So once he knew that I, Jonathan, was a lifelong friend from childhood, I knew Jonathan, and and uh, once he knew, he wouldn't leave me alone. Mm -hmm. You know, until he got to meet Jonathan. And then Jonathan wound up on Mork and Mindy. Yes, I remember. Cause Playing he was Robin's like, son. His son, that's right, because the older, but the younger, yeah, they, but they, they reverse their age. Yes, 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 so yes. Dyslexic aging. <laughs> but yeah, but Robin was brilliant, and, and, and what a tragic story. Very much so. I mean, it, uh, I'm glad that there is more of a spotlight being shown on mental health about that. Because uh, also Jonathan, both, I mean, both of them had... Uh, Jonathan was put away two or three times. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, yeah they hauled really? him away. Yeah, they hauled him away. Yeah. Wow, wow. Uh, back when I, when I was growing up, I mean, I could tell you lots of Jonathan stories when I was growing up, but... Uh, but yeah, it's tragedy. I but, mean, you but, could, what, what might have been, what other wonderful gifts he would have given the world had he uh, chosen a different path. Um, well, yeah. well but, but he gave the world, they both gave the world what they had. They did, yes. They, they found their... Their, their reason, you know, for being. Mm -hmm. And they were both fortunate enough to be able to excel at that and share that with a very wide audience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Robin was a very compassionate human being and you could, very deep and private human being, very quiet, the opposite of the public Robin, 
was the, the private Isn't robbery. that interesting about performers, how they can, some, not all, but some, can be, you think that they're so effusive and they're so gregarious, and, and then their reality, it, you know, And Jonathan right, was so a very serious man, but in you, you put two people in the same room with him, and he was, Jonathan, well, Jonathan and I would go antiquing together, because I'm a collector and an mm, antique, I'm cool. and he was a great, I mean, a big collector. And so he didn't like to drive, so I'd pick him up, and we'd go to these huge antique flea markets and stuff in L.A. And we would, we would get to like the first booth, okay, and and it's me and, jo and Jonathan would pick up a, a mounty hat, you know, and put it on, and suddenly I had to interview him. So I, you know, I'd pick up a broom or something. It was a microphone, and I'd be interviewing him, uh -huh. you know, and a crowd would gather, oh my and God. and we'd do like twenty minutes there. 50, I mean, I'm, maybe I'm exaggerating, not much. And and then we would finally leave, and he'd yell at me afterwards. He'd say, "Why didn't you get me out of there?" I said, "Why did you put the hat on?" <laughs> so uh, Robin Williams, you would do improv with him. Uh, he was what amazing. was that like? He, why, he was so he. Robin w was hard to do improv with because he would switch characters so quickly. You know, you'd be think you're in a scene with one person. Suddenly, you know, the mask would come off, and it's a whole different person. You had to figure out what's the reality now. Uh huh. Uh huh. You know, but <clears throat> I was the only person that I know of, and I, I, I'm tickled with this, and and uh, it sounds like I'm bragging, and maybe I am. But I'll only, brag away. But, but I'm the only not. person I know of that broke Robin up on stage. Yeah. One. How time. did you do that? One time. And I, there's a character I used to do, and it was, it was a Cuban guy. It was like a Cuban, like a, the soup Nazi. In fact, some people say the soup Nazi was, was based, off, based of. off of this character I used to do. But it was a Cuban guy, and I had never done it in front of Robin. But he was overbearing guy. Wouldn't let you get a word in edgewise. It'd be, you know, he'd be right on top of you. And so we, we got into a scene because we literally said, what do you want to see? And the audience would say, you know, a centipede goes to the shoe store or something, whatever it was. And we would just do that. So there was no way of knowing what you're going to wind up with. So yeah. we'd grab a pair of glasses or a funny hat or something, and they'd get up and we were in a character suddenly. So I pulled this character out that I had done before, and, and he had never seen this character. And he was playing his little boy character, his little boy character, uh -huh, uh -huh. which he did so well. And I was this overbearing guy that wouldn't let him get a word in edgewise. And trying to stop Robin from getting a word in edgewise was what I did. <laughs> well, he he broke out laughing, and during the course of the laugh, he went back into character and finished the laugh as a little boy. That's how brilliant he was. Wow! He took so I'm really music. bragging for him, I guess. He used but it, I did yeah. break him up. <laughs> but he, he 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 shielded it and and disguised it by getting back into character, mm -hmm. which was genius. Wasn't it, that? Those are moments audiences love that when people do break up, uh, crack up. Oh, and Carol Burnett. Carol Burnett show all the time. I mean, Harvey Korman. Red Skelton. Yes, yes, Red Skelton. Uh, and so. Did you guys ever do that on the Laverne and Shirley show? Any of Break those? Up? Yeah, any of the moments in, in shows like that? Or there was, the I'll tell you, there was once, the first Laverne and Shirley I did, I played the cop. And uh, actually, I was the second guy to play the cop. The first one was Bo Capral, and, and I came in to replace Bo. And, um, and I got that job without an audition. Really? Insane. That's the best way to get a job. Another sometimes. story, but, <laughs> but I'm on there, and Phil Foster, who played Laverne's dad, you know, wah, 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 wah. yeah, yeah. It's great. I loved him. Brooklyn. I used to introduce him as Brooklyn's ambassador to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Phil had these bushy eyebrows and the bushy sideburns and the bushy mustache and the weird eyes and the, mm -hmm. and he was like a cartoon character, you know. And uh, and so I, I'm handcuffed to Laverne, okay, and I bring her into the pizza bowl. And I'm looking for her father. I'm looking for, and and he's in the middle of trying to get an award, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. for being a nice guy. <laughs> I can see where that's so, going. <laughs> so I'm, interrupt, I'm interrupting, and and uh, so uh, I, I come in, and his I said, Is, you know, Frank DeFazio in here anywhere? And his line was, he was supposed to come up to me and say, look, I'm clean. She don't even live with me. It's his daughter. Well, that line used to break me up. So I had 
all rehearsal, you know, we rehearse all week, and every time we rehearse, he'd come up to me and those bushy eyebrows right in my face. I'm clean. She didn't even live with me. <laughs> you know, so how's the idea of a guy abandoning his own daughter just because he's getting Give an, an award, award for being nice. Being nice. <laughs> it was so funny to me. I never got through any time without, during the whole week without breaking up. He yeah. broke me up every time. So now it's my first show, and it's my first TV show, my first network television show in front of a live audience. Yeah. I'm a nervous wreck on this one scene because I've never gotten through it. And Philly was a friend, and we used to go to lunch together and stuff. And and now I'm nervous, and I'm backstage ready, ready for my entrance, and I'm thinking, you know, leprosy, dead babies. I'm thinking everything, <laughs> I'm anything to get me, you know, the most morbid things in the world I could think of <laughs> to get me so I wouldn't laugh. And the, yeah. the harder you try, of course. Yeah, yeah. And so, <clears throat> okay, stop for my answer. I go out there. I go, Frank DeFrazio in there anywhere? And he looks at me and he knows I'm going to go. So he turns away and throws the line away. His laugh line. He throws the line away so he wouldn't break me up. Wow. And that's and you can see that that was supposed to be his laugh line and he didn't get a laugh on his laugh line. A comedian giving up a laugh for some new kid. That's pretty big. That's, that was huge. That's I'll never forget him for that. Wow. But you know, because you don't you're on television, you know, it's at Paramount Studios. Mm -hmm. These were shows were done on thirty five millimeter film, not videotape. Mm -hmm, it was, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. you know, we had a cinematographer. I mean it was a lot of money. Every minute was a lot of money in production. It still is these days. But so you don't want to stop because of you, especially if you're a guest. You know, if you're not a regular, you know, especially then it's it's a whole different ball of wax. You don't yeah. want any problems because of something you did or didn't do. You want everything to go smoothly. Mm -hmm. So the idea of having them stop because I break up was terrifying me. Mm -hmm. But I'll never forget him for that. Wow. Phil Foster. God bless you, Phil. What a guy. What yeah, a guy. Really, Stand-up guy. guy. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about uh, Elvis and me. I mean, Priscilla Presley. You got to know Priscilla. Yeah, yeah. And, and Lisa Marie. And really, Lisa Marie, all of the, the I mean, I went to, did I, a couple of years back in 2018, I went to uh, Memphis on Graceland? Beale Street. I didn't get to Graceland, oh, wow. but I went down Beale Street to do research for Million Dollar Quartet when we were doing it in 2018. <coughs> and of course, I mean... It's the home of the blues. I mean, just the, the music that's there, the history, no all the people that started where, uh, from Sun Records and, and beyond. Uh, and eventually I'll go back down and go to, go to Graceland. But I um, went to the, one of the museums that was affiliated with the Smithsonian that has to do with so many of the greats. Anyway, <clears throat> but what was that like? I mean, you were playing a character, the, the, the guy. Joe, Joe Esposito. Joe Esposito, who, who was, was the, Elvis's best friend. He was Is Elvis's right? best friend. He was head of the what they called the Memphis Mafia, ah. the group around him. He was the lead guy. He was his, you know, his his stage road manager. He was in charge of all the guys around Elvis. Yeah. And he was Elvis's best friend. He met Elvis when Elvis was in the service in Germany. They were in the service together. Okay. So the Elvis and me was based on Priscilla Presley's book mm -hmm. of the same name, which was her life with Elvis, which started when she met him in Germany. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is a, the, that's the cover of the DVD, as you can see it. That's the yeah. one, that's the... 1988. 1988. And um, so... The real life inside story of the king of rock and roll and the girl who became his queen. Yeah, it's a great story. and. And so when they did this miniseries, it was actually a miniseries mm -hmm. uh, when it was originally out in ABC. And at, at that time, it was one of the top 10 rated miniseries of all time, mm. you know, from roots on down, mm -hmm. it was in the top mm -hmm. 10. And uh, now they've since condensed it into like a, a movie, uh, but originally it was a miniseries. And uh, so I, I played his, his best friend who met him at the same time that Priscilla met him. So I'm all through that story. And I'm the one that you know that gave him artificial respiration, you know, mm. at the end when he, mm -hmm. when he was when he passed. I'm the one that welcomed Priscilla back to Graceland after he, you know they had been divorced, and you know he died, and she had to I had to tell her that uh, you know I couldn't break the news to Lisa that she's going to have to do that. Mm -hmm. And you know it was a, a very poignant story. But that that miniseries, uh, Elvis and Me, she was executive producer of it. Priscilla was. So she was very involved 
in making sure that it was real. The guy that played Elvis didn't really look all that much like Elvis. Dale Mintkiff was his name. He was in Pet Cemetery. Yeah, yeah, he was. I remember seeing Pet Cemetery. Afterwards, yeah. At, yeah, later on. It was, yeah. And, and, and Love Potion Number 9. Yeah. Dale Mintkiff, a, a, a yeah. Wonderful actor. He did not look like Elvis, and, and he was not an Elvis impersonator. Mm -hmm. But she wanted him for the for to play Elvis because she said that he captured the private Elvis, the real Elvis, mm -hmm. the Elvis, you know, behind closed doors, mm -hmm. better than anybody else. Kind of like that Robin Williams thing being out that way and exactly. the way it was. Yeah, exactly. And nobody knows that better than Priscilla. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so it was. And I, you know, Dale and I, I took it upon myself. You know, all of that miniseries was done in sequence. Now it's block and shoot, okay? We call it block and shoot, which means there was no audience and it's, it's done on location. So, mm -hmm. so we, we traveled all over. Went to Quebec, Canada to be to work as Germany, the cobblestone streets, mm -hmm. just changed all the street signs. And um, uh, went to Vegas. We, had to, we filmed the Vegas uh, scenes at the Old International, which at that time was the Hilton. Mm -hmm. But they had not changed that showroom at all. It was the same <laughs> showroom that Elvis, they had oh, not done wow. anything to it. We used Elvis's dressing room, which at that time was being used by their headliner at the time, Bill Cosby. And uh, uh, but we used that dressing room. It was all done really authentically, as authentically as possible. Dan, uh, Jan Pierce, of Jan Pierce, Larry Pierce directed, P-E-E-R-C-E. -E. And um, uh, he was Jan Pierce's, you know, the famous Oh yeah, yeah. Jan Pierce's son. He directed Goodbye Columbus. You know, he was a great director. You know, great, really nice guy too. Anyway, but that was all done in sequence. So over the period of months that we did that, you know, production of that, it was all done in sequence. So the earlier sequences were done first, then the last sequences. That's a great to give you that whole. Journey. Well, that's never right. done. No, because, out because it's always sequence. It's yeah. always like you shoot all the scenes in the same location. It's all done by money. This was done in sequence. Wow. So as an actor. You know this, you know, as an actor. That really helps that. Over a period of months of this huge project, yeah. I was immersed in this character. I mean, I, I really, to this day, I never met Elvis, mm -hmm. but I felt like I, I, I can sit here right now and feel like I know Elvis. Mm -hmm. Because I felt like I lived, there's a part of me that felt like I lived that life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it was all in sequence, and I was so immersed in it. I was driving the Lincoln Mark, whatever it was in those days. Wow. Elvis was on, you know, on the cassettes in those days, and you know, from uh, "That's All Right, Mama" to "Suspicious Minds," it was blaring on. You know, and I'm mm -hmm. driving with the sunglasses, and I'm, <laughs> I'm in character. You yeah. know, Diamond Joe, you know, Diamond Joe Esposito, and um, and and then on our off times, I would take Dale and I'd take him around town in Hollywood, you know, and. Like he was Elvis, you know. We go to you know Dantana's and you know Nikki Blair's, and I you know doing I'd, a little method acting, doing, doing you know, right, exactly. Yeah, because he was very nervous about playing Elvis. It's a huge role for him at yeah, that time. I mean, come on, everybody and, has enough. And my oh, that. well, yeah, it's so hard to play a character like that because yeah. no matter how good you are, you're always going to be criticized because mm -hmm. you're not. You're never going to be what someone's image. You're always going to find something. So he knew that, and and so I wanted to. You know, and so I was his sort of lifeline, you know, to keep him in character. And I'd always bolster him on and off camera, which I felt was my job, you know, playing that role. Yeah. And I, and I did. But wow. to this day, you know, I really felt like I was there. There's a part of me that feels like I was there, even though mm -hmm. I, I never was. But I got to meet Colonel Parker. I got oh. to meet oh. Jerry Schilling, who was the, um, uh, the consultant on the show. He was the, the young kid in the real group. I got to meet uh, Joe Esposito, the real Joe Esposito. I got to meet. What, what 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 was that like meeting the guy that you're playing? How did that go? It was tenuous. It was you know he I guess maybe he was the only one at that time that had not written a book about Elvis, had not capitalized on his relationship with Elvis, mm -hmm. and I guess maybe he thought that he should have been the consultant on that show. I'm not uh, sure. Yeah. But but he was. Yeah, but you can't say no was, to Priscilla. I mean, he it's was, Priscilla. Right? He was reluctant to talk to me. Huh. And, but we, he was cordial and, and I got some, but there was a, a I, I never really got to know him and I yeah. wanted to get to know him. Right, right, you right. You know, cause you wanna, yeah. but, I, but the reason I wanted to talk to him is because I wanted to do him justice. Mm -hmm. You know, cause a lot of, you know, a lot of people say, well, these guys around Elvis, they're all users and stuff. And I didn't believe that. 
maybe some of them were, but mm -hmm. Elvis was, you know, in 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 the, uh, the in the quartet show you guys are doing. These are beyond vocalists, beyond you know rock musicians. These are icons. Yeah. You know, from from Carl, you know, to 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 Johnny Jerry Cash, Lee. to yep. Jerry Lee. Yep. But then you get to Elvis, and that's another level entirely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, our is director it, yesterday oh, was our first day of rehearsal, and DJ Salisbury is uh, joining us back again from uh, Orlando, Florida. He directed the first two productions, and he's, when he was talking about, you know, everybody has certain uh, ideas. They they think they know these other characters. So talking not about Elvis yet, but about the others. They feel like they know them. So in a way, the audience it kind of, it's welcoming. It's freeing for us. Except for Elvis. Elvis is so specific. And then uh, Jacob, who's playing Elvis, he's like, and then that damn movie came out. Have you seen the recent? Yeah, I, have. I, have, I haven't I have. seen it yet. No, I have, yeah. Um, I came it's home, I drove, drove It's home. wonderful, and he's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, no, yeah. He's, he's, I've heard great he, things. Yeah, he's brilliant. Yeah. I did not like Tom Hanks playing Colonel Parker. I met yeah. Colonel Parker. Tom Hanks was nothing like the real Colonel Parker. Yeah. Uh, and, and I thought he phoned in that performance, did a cliche impression. I'll probably get criticized for that, but it's, I'm being honest. And I don't know any other way to we, we look forward to your tweets. <laughs> <laughs> be kind, be kind. Be kind, please. <laughs> but I did not like I did not like Tom Hanks, but yeah. I loved everything else about that about that film. And Elvis, the portrayal of Elvis was I mean, riveting. Yep. It was very powerful. But, you know, the guy you got playing Elvis is awfully darn good, man. He is yeah. really good. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be, I can't wait for you guys to come check it out. Sales are already going crazy. I mean, it's selling. And, you know, people usually say, yeah, get your tickets. It's selling. It's selling. Get your tickets. <laughs> well, and, you know, and that's the other thing is, you know, you know, I, I, I do, you know, I'm doing, I'm a jazz vocalist, and I've been a vocalist yeah. since I was 16 years old in New York. I was terrible then, and hopefully I'm better. No, I'm sure you're great. But, no, I was terrible then, but but that was my time. Yeah, man, yeah, then. When, 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 but, I yeah. learned, I learned from that. <laughs> We're always learning, right? Always learning. But, yeah, but, you know, and this really, I think, is an important message. A place like Greater Indianapolis, Mount Carmel, you know, which is part of Greater Indianapolis, and part of what makes... Greater Indianapolis, so great, I must tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we're proud. Of, we're proud of you. Proud. Should be, yeah. uh, but w one of the wonderful things about it is the arts, the live arts community here, from music to theater, it's absolutely really impressive. And I've been all over the world and all over the country as yeah. a performer, and this is really impressive here. Uh, I, I just, I really, I love. Being well, and you also know Michael Feinstein. I, well, yeah, for since 1977. When did you guys first meet? No, it's old 1977. But what was the was it a gig? Was it a back at that improv show? I was telling you about oh, Robin Williams. Okay. We had a piano player. Huh. And because we would, they would play interlude music. You know, when we're trying to find a funny hat to do the scene to the audience, and then we would finish Act One and Act Two with some sort of a music. We would ask the audience uh, name a, a musical format. You know. With, Broadway musical, opera, you know, whatever you want, you know, whatever it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then give us like three words or give us a phrase. Or, and then we would get up and improvise a musical. That's great. <coughs> wow, well, that's not easy. So, at all. so we had a piano player there. Well, Michael was our substitute piano player. No we couldn't way. get the real guy. We got Michael, <laughs> which was incredible because Michael was, wow. a, was a genius yes. even then. Yeah. I mean, truly, I used to go to see him. He was. Performing, uh, he used to do a piano bars uh, performance at a, a hotel in Beverly Hills. I can't remember which one it was now, but I would go to see him because he was doing in in Beverly Hills what Bobby Short had been an icon for mm -hmm. doing in New York at mm -hmm. Cafe Carlisle. Mm -hmm. You know, playing all this great American songbook stuff yeah. with such yeah. passion and such dedication and such great knowledge, and that came through even then. And he's built on it ever since. I mean, uh, Great American Songbook is a passion of mine. That's the music I was raised on. It was my parents' music. Mm -hmm. But it's a, um, a body of, of work that is uniquely American and that we should be awfully proud of. Great poetry and great music. Some of the greatest composers and lyricists that ever lived performed their work in that genre. And it's it's in danger of being lost because you know because music 
proceeds and goes in different directions. Well, new is not only not always better. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to toss away the old to take the new. You can keep both, just yeah. like architecture. You don't have to tear down glorious old buildings to build right. new ones. Building and preserving and presenting that great body of work to new audiences and keeping it alive. Yeah. And, and I am forever grateful to him for that. And I've done that in my small way. He's done it on a very grand scale and has been able to, thank God. And uh, so, but he was doing it even then. Yeah. And uh, and I remember when my first album came out, the one you held up earlier. Now, that's that's the, this yeah, one yeah, here, yeah, plain, yeah, yeah. plain Old Me. But then we're going to talk also about this one, If Love Were All. So that's got the one that's on the Sinatra channel right now. This is the one? Okay. Yeah. Oh, anyway, before now. we get to that, but okay, when, yeah. Michael, when Michael, when that album, the first album, first came out, I'm in Tower Records on Sunset Boulevard. I remember. Oh, yeah. In Hollywood. You know, oh, well, I'm in New York at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Place. Tower there, yeah. And and uh, it ran the Sunset Strip. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm in there because the album had just come out. And they had a they had a um, they had a, a computer system in those days. This is like 1993, so it was before the internet, really, uh -huh. all that stuff. All right, yeah. put that down. Okay. It was before the internet and all that stuff, and and they, there was a computer system in Tower Records called the Muse system. I don't know if you remember that, probably before your time, but it it was you were able to go there in the store and do research yes. and find yes, I and there'd be a little that. picture of the album cover uh -huh. and stuff if you were lucky. So I would you know I, the album came out. I'm in Tower Records to make sure that I'm on the Muse system, make sure that the album is you know. Is, is like double faced, you know, in the, <laughs> you know, and it was a little divider card with my name on it. I wanted to make sure that I was, because this was where That's the, music, big deal. That's big the music industry came to this store. I yeah. wanted to make sure I was present there. So I'm in there doing that, and there's Michael. And I, said, I hadn't seen him in a while. I said, hey, Michael. He goes, hey, Wayne, what are you doing here? I said, well, I, you know, my album just came out. I mean, He's out doing the same thing. His <laughs> album just came out. So I bought his album. He bought my album. That's, <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. That is great. I remembered in New York City, it was Colony Records that we yeah. to. Well, yeah, absolutely. That. Yeah, I do. Loved Colony. I mean, you could get memorabilia. You could get albums. See, I'm, I'm a big on the vinyl. I love the vinyl. There's something well, tangible I'm gonna, I'm gonna about give, the Well, I'm going to give this to you. This is, oh, um, thanks. This is if, you, if you really love vinyl, you can play vinyl. Yeah. This is out on vinyl. It's also out on on DV, on CD. It's also out in MP3s or whatever. But the new album is um, three of the tunes are, are on the Sinatra, seriously Sinatra on Series XM, okay. which is owned and programmed by the Sinatra family. Oh so it's, wow! It's, to me, it's like winning a you know winning a, yeah a, yeah a Grammy. It's huge. Me. Yeah, to to me. But it was all recorded live in the studio. No overdubbing. No auto tune. No any of that computer mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. All acoustic instrumentation. It's the real deal, and it was recorded in sequence. You know, like uh, Elvis and me done. It. Yep. That's to me. That's because the the album has a beginning, middle, and an end. It's the universal saga of love lost and love found, and you you. Oh, so it ends with the love found. That's good. It goes from one place to another. Yeah. And it's it's not. It won't hit you over the head. But if you're aware of that, you'll get it. Yeah. And if you don't get it, that's fine. But. If you can listen to it, listen to it in sequence if you can, because okay. it, it has a beginning, middle, and an end. And uh, but but that album is uh, uh, it's been played internationally, and and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased. But that's on they put it out now this on one, this is this one. Right? Dub, yeah, they made it into a, one, into a CD, and it's called "If Love Were All." And uh, oh, put it over here. Thank you, thank you, Philip. And uh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're hiding me. Oh. Wait a minute. oh. <laughs> Hi, it's this guy. <laughs> this guy. This album right here. <laughs> yes. Anyway, but uh, but they did it on one eighty gram uh, audiophile vinyl, broke it into a double album, so they spread the tracks out. Oh wow! You know what I mean? And then it's a it's polyline sleeves. I mean, they they spared no expense. That's awesome. And, uh, and I, I'm, it, so the sound is amazing on there. I thought the. The CD had very present sound because I'm after authenticity. Mm -hmm. Music to me is what's in between the notes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's that's why I, I we all play together. We don't lay down the rhythm and then the the horns and or whatever and then the vocals last because you can't interact that way. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to interact because it's that give and take, mm -hmm. just like in a scene. You know, you want to you want to play a scene as an actor. You want the other person there with you, even if you're doing a close up. You want the other person off camera. So that when you're doing that close-up, 
you have someone to respond to. Mm -hmm. So there's there's something happening to to keep the moment, keep you in the moment, and keep the moment alive, so that you're constantly surprised and going somewhere else. You know? Yeah, that's a, that's what I love about the the energy back and forth between artists and audience and audience it's and like, audience. It's like throwing a ball back and forth. I love performing yes. live. Yes, there's nothing like it. They're the other. They're the they're an integral cast member in the storytelling. Well. And that's what I was yeah. trying to drive at before, you know, with your theater and, and with, with you know, live music, Feinstein's, I hope you all come, uh, because the, the, the arts community in this area is so vibrant, you want to keep it that way. And the way to keep it that way, my dad always said, your loudest v vote is with your dollars. Mm -hmm. That's, that's your loudest vote. So if you want to you want something and you want more of something and you want to make sh sure something remains available to you support it with your dollars buy tickets buy albums go to theater come to clubs see live performance because when you see a live performance you're not only supporting that you are a part of it that live yeah. performance is not like watching something on a screen it's in the moment it will never be the same yeah. any other time and you are a part of it yeah, no, absolutely. That is a perfect way to end our, our uh, podcast today. I can't thank you enough. You, you verbalized exactly what so many arts organizations are going through right now and communities are going through. Especially post-COVID and stuff. Yeah. Everybody's been hurting. The ones that survived, a lot of them didn't. Mm -hmm. The ones that survived, we all need your support. And, and and it's not you know that you're magnanimous. You will benefit from it. Yes, absolutely. So. And so come and check out Wayne's show at Feinstein's at Hotel Carmichael. July twenty second. Twenty second. Yes, sir. Go to Feinstein'sHC.com. Uh, I believe their their tickets are on Eventbrite. Is how they're doing their ticket pro platform. But you and can go to the a, website. There's a, and there's and a video available. If you go if you go on to oh good Feinstein's HC, there's a video you. will you get to you know see a little bit of what you're going to see and whatever get a flavor of it. Awesome! And I'll be at Feinstein's Hotel Carmichael on July 6th, yes, just you before you. Your, I'll do my Sinatra, Sinatra show. Thing. Yeah, terrific. All the way. So anyway, uh, thank you so much, Wayne. What a guy! I mean, I could oh, talk to this guy for hours and hours and hours. All right, we'll and stick I, around. We'll stick around. <laughs> no, I know you guys have just limited time on your lunch break. Well, I just so want to say this: we were supposed to have lunch. I haven't been served lunch yet. I'm hungry. <laughs> kind of a lunch break is this? You got coffee. Oh, I got. Coffee. We're on a liquid diet. <laughs> yeah, but there's nothing in the coffee. Oh, no. <laughs> we'll you see guys. you guys next week. And, and be sure to check out Million Dollar Quartet. Tickets yes, are selling sir. like crazy. Uh, go to 317-843-3800 for tickets or ATIStage.org. And it's June 16th and 17th, and that's it. Around the so, corner. Right around the corner. All right, we'll see you next week, and uh, we'll have some of those cast members. We might have our Million Dollar Quartet right here to do a, a little interview and spend some time and maybe we'll get a song out of them. Who wow. knows? That might be kind of cool. We'll see you next week, Wednesday at 12 noon. Bye. Thank you so much.